Hi everyone, my name is Paul Kanyuk. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we do shading at Pixar. Um, this is a presentation that I've given at uh, SIGGRAPH Asia, as well as during recruiting trips. Um, I haven't given it in a while, this is not very polished, but I figure might as well record it um, so I can share the information. So here goes. A uh, little of my background, I'm a lead TD at uh, Pixar. I've been doing crowds uh, for a number of years, um, but originally I got my start in shading. I also teach uh, RenderMan and CrowdSim at the Academy of Art University, and I got my undergrad in digital media design at the University of Pennsylvania. So in particular, I'm going to talk about pattern generation at Pixar. So not so much um, how materials interact with light, but how we create the patterns that we use to drive the parameters on our materials. And we do these in a number of ways. I'm going to start with procedural pattern generation. Now, in computer graphics, uh, proceduralism, the term tends to refer to algorithmic methods uh, to create imagery, as opposed to getting uh, data from a stored file or direct artistic input. So in other words, creating art using a recipe rather than a paintbrush or uh, a mouse. So I'd consider proceduralism an example of that being a script to generate a model of a plant rather than creating it by hand by extruding cubes one by one. Um, similarly, a shading network that combines patterns and images together to create a texture would be procedural as opposed to just painting it by hand. And at Pixar, we tend to uh, focus on the former. Um, now, there's pros and cons to pure proceduralism. Um, one of the great things about uh, proceduralism is you can uh, usually create detail at any scale without repetition. Um, we can also, once you have a recipe to create a look, uh, variety tends to be very trivial. You tend to just change the seed or some of the inputs of your recipe. You can get very different looks. Proceduralism can also potentially be very efficient. Um, you could create detail with far less memory than if uh, it were stored directly. Um, now, uh, there's also cons to proceduralism. Um, there tends to be a steep learning curve to learning procedural techniques uh, than more direct methods. Um, slowness, uh, even though, as I mentioned earlier, proceduralism can be more efficient, it also can be slower. It depends on what's in your procedure. And uh, fragility, um, uh, this uh, ties into the difficulty aspect of proceduralism. Um, complicated uh, procedures uh, can be harder to debug. Um, for instance, a shading network um, can create a whole bunch of colors, and if one pixel is the wrong color, you got to go node by node in your shading network, see where the problem occurred. Whereas if you just read from a texture, it'd be pretty obvious where the wrong color came from. Uh, there's a lot of tools for proceduralism. Uh, this is a really old slide. Um, I'm just going to skip over that. We're going to focus on RenderMan, but suffice to say, Houdini and other tools also uh, support procedural workflows. Um, so start uh, with a little bit of history lesson here. So at Pixar, uh, from Toy Story to Incredibles, all of our shaders were hand-coded in RenderMan shading language. Uh, this shows you some uh, shader code, some RSL code that was used uh, for Finding Nemo. Um, and yeah, we pretty much just programmed our shaders um, uh, during that time. Now, it sounds scary, uh, but it's actually um, not necessarily the least intuitive way to create shaders. Um, in fact, in games, this is still very often, um, I mean, this is pretty much the only way people write shaders. Um, so patterns, you know, can come from many sources. In this case, this bit of coral from Finding Nemo. Uh, we've got one pattern for color, another scalar pattern for a length along the, uh, the coral, another one for some bumpy texture, a displacement pattern, and then the dot product of the normal and the uh, camera vector. And those might be a bunch of patterns. In our shader, we might uh, start with um, some color pattern, uh, multiply and scatter, then multiply in the tip distance pattern, um, do a smooth step on that distance pattern so that any value below 0.4 is black to uh, darken the base of the coral, then multiply it by our texture details, and then finally by that uh, little fuzz uh, effect, that dot product of our normal and the eye vector. And this is what a lot of our shaders look like. Um, perfectly natural way to do shading, but uh, in the end, node graphs really uh, tend to be the way that at least technical artists at Pixar like to work. So we sort of uh, made a shift from, uh, from coding our shaders into node graphs. Um, so we no longer have to write RSL by hand, we can create shaders. This also allows us to package up good bits of 
RSL into nodes as opposed to letting everyone write their own. Um, so uh, patterns are expressed through nodes. Each of them makes a little snippet of RSL. So these patterns combined can kind of create uh, an orange in this case. That's the node network that I used to create that lovely orange that I usually uh, show as the first lesson of my RenderMan class. Now there are a whole number of uh, patterns that we can combine together in our procedure. Um, at the risk of overusing this term, some patterns are purely procedural, like fractal noise, in that they are just an algorithm. There's no texture anywhere. Um, now, noise is great because it's you know never repeats, seamless, infinite level of detail. But there's only so many things you can express with noise. Now, photographs is the other end where um, they tend to be very accurate. You know, they're derived from nature. But uh, there's only so much detail you get in the photograph, no more than the uh, pixels you have, and also they're periodic. You'll see this thing tile, um, have tile, even if it um, is seamless. And yeah, it can be difficult to edit photographs, a lot of painting in Photoshop. Um, there's sort of a halfway between, um, which is a 2D texture generation. Uh, which is a class of uh, procedures for creating patterns that might not work in 3D but could be done in 2D. Uh, filter Forge is an example. A lot of Photoshop filters are 2D texture generators. Um, they can produce uh, uh, perfectly tiling and virtually non-periodic textures, so a big you know, 4K tiling texture at the right scale. You'll never see a repeat. Um, there's more possibilities than noise. But it's not as accurate as photographs, and yeah, these textures can be huge. So those are the types of patterns we use at Pixar that you know many people use as part of their procedural uh, shaders. Um, now, one of the things uh, we do, particularly with set shading at Pixar, is we like to avoid dependence on UVs, and that allows us actually to um, generalize shader from object to object because you know it's based on the shape as opposed to the UVs. And uh, one of the ways we do that is to use rounded cube mapping. And the idea here is to uh, project your texture onto the object along three axes and use the uh, dot product of uh, the normal on one of those three axes to blend between the textures. So it's like a cube map, but you sort of blend along the edges. And it's cool because, like as I mentioned earlier, it's not based on UVs. It is only based on the shape of the, uh, of the object. So this allows you to you know, move your shaders from object to object, and this is very beneficial when you're shading lots and lots of stuff. And that's what shading artists at Pixar have to do. Um, we also uh, like to work in layers. Um, here's an example of uh, a material with uh, metal, rust, chip paint, dust, and dirt layers. Very common. Um, and this is a shader I put together years ago. But just to like break out each of those layers, that metal layer is purely procedural. It's all just fractal noise. Uh, some smooth steps there to get some uh, flakiness. Uh, rust, uh, in this case, is actually a tiling photographic texture, so you will see some repeats and patterns, but the rust tends to be very noisy anyway, so we get away with it. And that's done with rounded cube mapping. Uh, chip paint is actually uh, a texture I created using 2D texture generation in Filter Forge, uh, two different patterns combined together. Um, again, that's uh, using rounded cube mapping. Dust, just fractal noise, and dirt is a combination of fractal noise and that uh, 2D uh, texture, um, 2D texture generation. Again, all with rounded cube mapping. Um, this is what the shader network looked like. Um, for anyone interested, this is what the node graph looked like um, 10 years ago and uh, what shipped with uh, RenderMan artist tools at the time. Now, uh, RenderMan for Maya. It's gone through many generations. Um, but that's what node graphs used to look like. And really, uh, that's uh, you can see the five layers I alluded to earlier. There's some nodes for dirt, some for chip paint, some for the rust, some for the metal, some for the dust. They're all sort of composited at the end. We'll have a scale input and uh, maybe some kind of... Um, Primvar is to uh, drive uh, where the effect happens. Um, so here's an example with uh, some slides I took from uh, Max Planck and Stefan Bugay's uh, SIGGRAPH talk from 2008. shows how we did the uh, shading on the robots in Wally. -E. So we had that base metal layer. We had some chip paint, um, some scratches, a little bit of oil stain. Um, yeah, there's the, some dust on top. 
Um, then we can have variations on that procedural texture. Like I mentioned, the benefit of proceduralism is that variation is easy. Changing the color and scratch patterns is trivial. The amount of scratching, usually changing a threshold somewhere, um, less scratching there. Man, so many slides. All right, and uh, so that's how we create a lot of our materials uh, for sets as well as characters. Um, and I alluded to this earlier, but I want to drive home the point that all of these shaders are based on the shape of the geometry, not the UVs. So we tend to call the patterns that emerge geometry-driven detail. And I have a little photo here I found on uh, Google that illustrates um, what aspects of the shape of the geometry we can use to drive these details. Um, so just looking at this photo, um, I can kind of see right here that there's dust that's collecting uh, on the top or the upward facing portions of the object, which tends to happen. Dust settles from above. Um, so that's a pattern that we can, again, drive with the shape of the object using upward facing or the dot product of the surface normal and world up. Um, another thing we tend to see is a lot of patterning in the concavities of the object. So down the creases, we see some like metal or rust uh, where the edges join. Um, and that's again, oh yeah, there's some rust on the edge right there. Again, that's based on the shape of the object and we can measure that using occlusion, which um, casts a dome of rays and the proportion that's occluded by nearby geometry uh, becomes you know, a stronger occlusion signal. So that's also again, based on the shape of the object, not on the UVs. Um, curvature. It's another shape-based signal. It's um, sort of the opposite of occlusion, where occlusion measures uh, concavities, curvature measures convexities. Um, and again, you can see like the color is changing on the edge of this object where it is uh, convex. And finally, there's a lot of details that just seem to happen randomly. And we know how to do randomness, that's noise. So, and again, noise is uh, often a 3D pattern based on the position of the object, and maybe it's normal. Um, so, based on shape, not UVs. Uh, we combine those together, and this is a uh, signal we tend to generate for many of our objects, some combination of occlusion, curvature, noise, and upward facing to drive where the details of our shaders occur. Um, here's an example where we're just using occlusion. This is um, an occlusion signal, and you can see how this is that uh, shader I showed earlier with those five layers, how it is uh, driving the presence of rust, the crap cracking of the chipped paint, and uh, the accumulation of dirt and dust. <coughs> and here's an example where I've applied that uh, to a building. And just for fun, I animated the... Uh, the presence of that geometry driven detail. Let me see if I can play that again. See how it animates and the paint is chipping off. Yes, this would be cool with some kind of acid chipping paint effect, but we don't really do that. We usually just dial it in um, per set, but it's pretty cool to have that flexibility. <coughs> Going back to Wally, -E, um, here's how that applies to some of our the robots. So there's an occlusion signal on a robot. Here is uh, curvature. Um, note this was a mathematically derived curvature where we applied a little bit of blur to it, but you could just do this by taking occlusion and using the inverted normal to get it from the inside of the object. Um, here's upward facing, not rocket science. Your normal uh, dot product of that and world up. Uh, and finally, a little bit of noise. It looks like we thresholded it to thresholded it if that's the term, to make it a little bit uh, more rusty. And we combine those together to get our geometry driven details. So occlusion, curvature, upward facing, and noise. And that's what is driving the details on this robot. Everything except for the stripe and that BNL logo, and maybe the eyes are created by geometry driven detail. And here's an example on some prop. Um, note that uh, once you have one of these recipes for you know chipped paint on metal, uh, it's easy to dial in details and create a lot of variety in instances of that shader. Um, here's a little tableau of all the robots we created using that. So as I mentioned earlier, that VNL logo on that stripe, well, that might not come from proceduralism. So we still have to, in our shaders, place graphic details. Um, 
Now, one way you can do this uh, by and still avoid UV dependence is to use uh, scalar fields on the object or primitive variables. That is, in Maya, just painting a float, so I, you know, from zero to one, and we can use that to drive some aging. So, in, on the left, I made uh, some uh, white vertices uh, towards the top of the object, and that scalar field drives the chipping paint on that building to the right. And this is a screenshot from my RenderMan class. All right, um, here is uh, an example of another type of graphic detail that we can add, um, which is using projections. Projections uh, involve using coordinate systems that are placed in space and then uh, reading a uh, texture based on that coordinate system. Um, since it's based on the coordinate systems and not the UVs, this is again a way to add graphic detail without UV dependence. So in this case right here, I'm adding graffiti on that building, which is using that chip paint shader I keep on showing. Uh, but the graffiti is coming from uh, some coordinate systems. Um, we do that a lot for details. Um, you know, in the past at Pixar, we actually took this to the extreme and had a tool called Picasso. Uh, I think we still have sort of a Picasso implementation where we uh, sort of do projections along all the axes on each object, break it apart, and paint uh, in Photoshop. And you can get some really, really crisp detail that way. But we've kind of moved away from that. It involves quite a bit of textures and isn't the, necessarily the most intuitive way to work. Um, also, at render time, you're doing projections add up. All those texture reads do have a cost at the end of the day, so you got to be careful. Um, so uh, we've actually been moving towards Mari for tumble painting, which is uh, painting in a UV dependent space, UDIM space, as we tend to call it. So yes, we do actually do tumble paint. Despite all the procedural, now and then you still gotta paint your details. Um, so for characters, we're willing to you know, suck it up, do the UVs. For sets though, there's still a lot of avoidance of this approach. Um, here's an example of some characters in Monsters University that have had a lot of their details painted in Mari. Um, and one of the cool things about Mari is a lot of those procedural techniques are actually there uh, in Mari as well. Apparently you can generate occlusion and use that signal to drive your textures in Mari. Uh, it's just at the end of the day in Mari they're baked out into textures in UV space so it's really hard to reuse from object to object. All right, um, so uh, at this point, I tend to stop this lecture and actually open up RenderMan Studio and give you guys a cool demo. In this case, I'm going to give you a demo of how to shade some terrain. So uh, coming up next, shading demo on terrain. Thanks.